let's move on from that. I think there was another, let me just let another person in and then uh, I'm going to mute you all as always. And, uh, and then I, Welcome back. sorry, Trip. Was it, was no, it this, is, this is why we're muting. Um, I'm going to mute you all and open us in prayer. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Gracious God, thank you for bringing us back together. It uh, feels like a long time since we have looked at each other on these uh, little screens. Um, we ask as we start this new journey through um, uh, your Bible and understanding how it came about and, and what, it, what it still means for us, uh, we ask that you would um, be with us, bring uh, our lives into this conversation, uh, bring what you want us to know into the time of teaching. Uh, we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. A couple more folks coming in. Um, so I have been thinking about this for a while, and, and I, was, I had an opening story uh, that I was going to tell, and then I saw a version of it happen right in front of me in the grocery store recently, and so I'm going to tell that first and then, and then lead into how I wanted to begin. But I was in uh, I was in the grocery store a week or two ago, and uh, I heard I heard this beautiful sound, and it, you know it, it was the sound of a mom with a, a fairly new baby in a stroller doing her shopping, but she just stopped right in the middle of the aisle to put her face right next to her baby's face and. Uh, and laugh with the baby and give the baby kisses and just shower the baby with uh, all kinds of uh, all kinds of love. And it was a beautiful thing. I, I, I'll confess that I, I sort of stopped in my tracks a little bit and uh, and watched her for a little bit. And she was oblivious to what was going on in the rest of the store. She was just so happily communicating love to that uh, to that little baby. Uh, it reminded me of something, and it reminded me of the thing that I was always going to do uh, at the beginning of this, uh, at the beginning of this journey, um, and and that is uh, this uh, a paragraph from uh, David Hubbard. David Hubbard was the president of Fuller when I was there, and before he was president, he was a professor of Old Testament at uh, at Wheaton. I think there's actually a couple people at uh, at the church who had. David Hubbard at, at I'm not, not Wheaton, at West Westmont. Yeah. At Westmont College. Yeah. Um, and uh, so he was at Westmont. Uh, David was a, David started out life as a conservative Baptist and then went to Scotland to get his PhD. Uh, he was the first American student at the University of St. Andrews to be invited to stay on as a teacher. Uh, and he stayed for a little bit, but he came back to Westmont. And then at the tender age of 33, was appointed president of, uh, of Fuller Seminary, where he served for 30 years. And so he was my Old Testament professor and also the president of the seminary while I was there. Um, anything I managed to learn about Amos, I learned that that process at least started in his class on Amos, uh, my goodness, back in 1988 or 89 or so. Uh, but he, he talks about, uh, in, in one of his books, uh, trying to draw an analogy between how it is that God speaks to us in scripture. And I, it's been a while since I've done this, so I'm going to share a screen again, but I'm going to read this out loud. He wrote this, he said, there is probably no sound like it in the world. It radiates warmth and tenderness. Uh, forgive me, let me let somebody in. Uh, it radiates warmth and tenderness. It conveys compassion and understanding. It confirms a sense of worth and dignity. It may well be the closest earth comes to the music of heaven, the sound of a mother speaking gently, almost cooing to a newborn child. Now, I'll say as one of the dads in the room that uh, I, I like to think that I cooed a few things to my newborn son too, but I, I get his point. And he went on after saying that to talk about that being an analogy for how God speaks to us. God is, 
we we don't understand God uh, necessarily on God's terms, but God reaches into our lives and communicates with us in ways that communicate warmth and compassion and love and hope and all of those all of those tender things uh, that uh, that Hubbard described in that paragraph. That's how God speaks to us in the scriptures. And so. Um, there are all kinds of views of what the Bible is and what it means and how we're supposed to use it in our life and faith and ministry. Um, for me, since the I read those words for the first time 35 years ago or so, um, that image of a parent communicating to a, a small pre-verbal child uh, has always been where I begin to think about what the Bible is for us. And so we're going to start this journey through the history and the meaning of the book we call the Bible. It's a, it's a necessary journey because the Bible is our gathering document. It is, our, uh, it is the document that uh, teaches us what God wants us to know about God's self. And uh, it is, uh, it's meant to bring uh, support and encouragement and even unity to the church. Although any of us who've been in the church for a while know that the Bible has rarely uh, been allowed to be a source of unity uh, for the people who call themselves Christians. Um, we're we're going to see some of that as we, by the time we get to the Reformation and people are burning people at the stake and drowning them for their interpretations of the Bible, we'll, we'll see just how far the church can go uh, away from what the Bible was meant to be. But at its heart, this uh, collection of books and letters and poems is meant to be a central part of our own journey of faith, at, both as God's revealing who God is, and also as the foundation and the, um, the guidebook for our own lives of discipleship. Um, and so just a, a few things, I'm going to try and use as much uh, gender neutral language as possible, but I'm also going to tell you I'm not going to tie myself in a knot to do it. Every once in a while, you might hear himself. Every once in a while, if I have the presence of mind, I might throw a herself in. We'll see. Uh, sometimes that's not where my brain goes naturally. That's just full disclosure for me. Um, but I get right from the beginning that when we talk about God, we're not talking about a being that has gender as humans have gender. We are talking about a divine being, even if we don't like it sometimes, uh, who reveals himself as father. And so we're going to wrestle with all those things. But I just want you to know I'm aware of how that sounds, and, and, uh, and I'm going to be as, uh, as sensitive to those issues as, uh, as I can. Um, along the way, we're going to pick up a lot of history. You have to expect that. Uh, this is the history of the Bible. Uh, but also, it's a look at how the Bible is put together, the kinds of literature that make it up, uh, and what those literatures are meant to teach us and what they're not meant to teach us. Uh, and so um, we're going we're gonna to do that. We're going to learn about some of the people who were involved in writing and preserving and sharing these important words. And we're going to grow in our understanding of what the Bible is and hopefully along the way, what the Bible is not. Um, there are gonna be some technical terms and I'm gonna, uh, um, if, if you run across a term while I'm talking, uh, write it down <laughs> and uh, we'll talk about it when I open it up for discussion at the end, but I'm gonna do my best to try and define some terms as we go. Zoom doesn't, I'm not good enough on Zoom to just pop up a word sometimes. And so uh, I'll share some documents and some charts as we go. Uh, but if, uh, if, if you run across a word that is unfamiliar to you, uh, because in all of our lines of work, there are words that are unique to our jobs. <laughs> and my goodness, Christian theology and Bible study has a ton of its own jargon to it. And so uh, we'll work at that. Um, I'll limit those and, and I'll explain them when we need them. Um, I'll encourage you to write things down as we learn together. And along the way, I'll try and um, uh, uh, suggest some other sources for us to look at uh, along this way. I don't know where this will end. I mean, 
some of you smart Alex are thinking, well, it ends at Revelation, right? I don't know where our Thursday night journey will end. This may pause at Advent and pick up again in January. And um, that's not because I'm going to be long-winded, or that may be a parallel reason. Uh, it, 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 it's because there's a lot of material. And if we're going to talk about the different literatures eventually and um, uh, of, of the Bible, we, we may want to devote a, a, a Thursday session to each one of those. And that'll be seven or eight weeks right there. So let's get started. Let's look at some of the basics. The Bible is made up of 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. There are some what we'll call regional variations on the numbers of books. There are some books that were not accepted into the Western canon. We are heirs of the Roman Catholic Church as Protestant Christians in the US, and, um, but there are some differences uh, in some church traditions and what they include um, and how they include it. And so we'll get to words like apocrypha and pseudepigrapha and some of the books that go into those collections, but just bear with me. We're not going to get to those just yet. For us, the Bible has 66 books, uh, 39 in the Old and 27 in the New Testament. For the most part, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew although there's a lot more to that story too. And for those of you who have been with me on Pentecost, uh, you know that, uh, that this uh, massive cultural change in the Western world in, the, in about 300 or so BC, where all of a sudden Alexander imposed one language over the entire known Western world, that changes everything for a lot of things. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. But uh, for the most part, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. Uh, the New Testament is written in a very particular kind of Greek called Koine Greek, which just means common Greek. And incidentally, that's the Greek that Alexander imposed on the Western world 300 years before Christ. And so by the time Christ rolls on the scene, uh, the Roman Empire, uh, North Africa, into Asia Minor, uh, and in, up into Europe, they all spoke common Greek, what was called co Koine Greek, K-O-I-N-E. And that Koine Greek is, uh, was the language of business and commerce and diplomacy, so that from Rome, uh, the emperor could govern all of the, the places that Rome had conquered, um, and they had been, they inherited this gift from Alexander the Great, which is a common language, and that common language was Greek. Even though we refer to the Bible as a singular thing, the word Bible, as we have it, comes from Biblia, which oddly enough is a Koine Greek word for books, plural. So actually, when I say open your Bible, I'm really saying open your books open the collection of books that we call the Bible. And so um, just a couple other things, because these will roll through uh, quickly, and we talk about them in other areas too, even on Sunday morning. When we talk about a testament, it's just another way of saying covenant. And so in, in some state law in this, uh, in some legal systems within the US, covenants can be, that word can be interchangeable with testament. So a last will and testament is really a last will and covenant. Um, and so uh, testament is a way of saying covenant. Uh, the, old, uh, the Old Testament and the Old uh, and the New Testament could just as easily be the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. What is it I say at communion once a month? This cup is the new covenant given in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. It is the New Testament in that cup. Um, the New Testament has been in its present form since about the year 120. The last book that made it into uh, our New Testament was written in about 120 AD. Uh, or uh, in some people call that the common era. Um, and so 
this is where anybody here who read Dan, Dan Brown's book, The Da Vinci Code, has to set aside what you know from that book or what you think you know from that book. Because I, I know that because I didn't make it through the book, I know that one of the plot lines or, or one of the premises is that Constantine, for a whole host of political reasons, trimmed or engineered a canon of scripture, a collection of books for the Bible that would suit his purposes. Uh, that's not true. That's literally 200 years after that collection of books was pretty much already solidified. Um, we talk about the word canon a lot, and canon is with one N. It's not a weapon. A canon is, a, uh, is another word for a ruler or a yardstick. And that's a really helpful image when we think about scripture, because uh, a ruler does two things. It tells you how far you can go, right? The limits of the ruler are the limits of distance, but it also helps you draw a straight line. And so when we talk about the canon of scripture, canon shows us where the limits are on what our beliefs can be. And it also keeps us uh, going straight in the, uh, in, 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 the, in the proper direction. I don't think it imposes something on us that we don't want. Well, maybe it does. But uh, canon and ruler are the same thing. And that's how you get the word uh, canon. The, the canon of scripture is the limit of what is acceptable within um, what, we are, 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 what we know to believe about God. And it also helps us keep things uh, going straight in the right direction. Even though the final canon wasn't ratified by a church council until the year 397 in Carthage, that was just an official rubber stamp on a collection of books that had been in use uh, since the early 100s and certainly in, into the early 200s. Uh, in the year 367, uh, a bishop that we talked about in the creeds class, Athanasius, uh, he was the Bishop of Alexandria in, uh, in Egypt. He named all 27 books that we have in a letter saying that they had been canonized years before. So there's, there's actually documentary proof that the canon as we have it, the collection of the New Testament as we have it, uh, has exist, existed a long time before the council that finally made it official. So we're going to get into that uh, when we start talking about the New Testament documents and how they circulated. Um, but uh, that's an important thing for us because I think it gives us confidence in, uh, in the scriptures as we have them. Uh, the way the scriptures were written, now I'm setting aside the, the Old Testament and the New Testament for now. The Old Testament uh, was transmitted orally for the first centuries of its existence. The stories of the Torah and the poetry and the writings and the prophets, those were passed down from generation to generation orally. And uh, one of the interesting things that we're going to talk about in a couple of weeks is that when Alexander imposed Greek on places that had spoken Hebrew or some other language before, suddenly the passing down of the oral tradition of the Old Testament shifted from Hebrew to Greek. Not everywhere, but in some places. But I'll tell you this, it was important enough that the Bible that Jesus quotes, the Old Testament that Jesus quotes and that Paul quotes in the New Testament, isn't the Hebrew Bible. It's the Greek Bible. So it's not an unimportant detail that some of the Old Testament was passed down in Greek, and other parts of it were passed down in Hebrew. Um, so why is all of this so important? Um, I mean, there's obvious answers to that, but let me just get a show of hands. Uh, you can just put your hands up in the screen just briefly. If you have been ordained 
as an elder or a deacon or a minister, put your hand up in the screen. Okay, I'm going to say just probably that that's a majority of the people who are attending tonight. When we ordain elders and deacons and ministers in the Presbyterian Church, here's one of the questions we ask. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church and God's word to you? All of you who raised your hands made a promise in front of this congregation or another congregation that that's the way we were going to, uh, that's what we were going to believe about the Bible, or at least what we were going to wrestle with believing about the Bible. And so that's what we say when we believe, that's what we say we believe when we accept God's call to leadership within the church, and it's what we're meant to model for the rest of the congregation. And so getting some of this background about the Bible uh, I think is really important, but I want to look at that question that we ask elders and deacons and uh, and ministers. It says, it says that we say three things about the Bible. First, we say that it is by the Holy Spirit. Second, we say it's the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church. And third, we say it is God's word to us. That's the personal one. We are a long way from baby talk now. And yet it is still God speaking to us through the scriptures as a parent speaks to an infant child. I don't think we ever want to lose that image or analogy for what the Bible is. But I want to look at those three things that we say we believe. The Old and New Testaments are, quote, by the Holy Spirit. There are all kinds of theories about how this happens. I'm going to show you. Um, I'm going to show you uh, those theories just a little bit. There are there are theories about the way we talk about inspiration. How is the Bible inspired by God? And um, there will be a few times where I get a little bit pedantic about words, but to inspire something is literally to be to fill it with the Spirit, to in spirit something. Um, and so, uh, there, but there are all kinds of theories of how this happens. Uh, that top one might be one of the more extreme ones, dictation theory. And that's basically that the, the writers of the individual documents that make up the Bible were sort of passive, passive pen holders. And the Holy Spirit basically dictated everything and wrote it through the, uh, the individual person. And uh, if you notice here, there are objections to the viewpoint over in the other column. And, and I like this one because it's very simple. Uh, if God had dictated scripture, then the style, vocabulary, and writing would be uniform. Uh, but if anybody has read more than a couple of books in the Bible, you know that unless they're written by the same person, they don't sound alike. Um, and then there are very various other ways to uh, to talk about that. Partial inspiration means only the things that are so important that we that God is the only one who could teach them. Those things are inspired, but the rest aren't, and that leads to degrees of inspiration, um, all the way down to this last one, which is another extreme version: uh, verbal and plenary uh, inspiration that both divine and human elements are present, but that the entire text of scripture, including every individual word, are a product of the mind of God expressed in human terms and conditions. And so the objection to that is that if uh, the same as the first one, if every word of scripture was a word from God, then there wouldn't be the human element uh, in the Bible. And we clearly see a human element in the Bible right down to the fact, just the one that pops into my head now is uh, the several times that Paul loses his temper at people. He says some pretty awful things to the Galatians. Um, and in Philemon, where he cajoles a friend, it uh, says that the friend's salvation depends on him, so why doesn't he release his slave? I mean, 
these are this is not the work of uh, a a um, someone just dictating doctrine, right? If the Bible were simply a book of theology, it would be written in a lot more organized way than it actually is. We're going to see some of that too. So there are all kinds of ways to talk about inspiration, but it's enough for us to acknowledge that the Holy Spirit is both present and responsible for the ultimate product of the Bible that we have now. In other words, inspiration is a hard thing to nail down. I will tell you a story from Fuller Seminary back in the 50s. A professor was tasked with getting the faculty together. And these are, these are um, primarily men back then. There were a couple of women who were on the, on the faculty. Um, they were from Harvard and Yale and Boston University and University of Chicago. And these were, these were evangelicals in the 50s, but with top-notch educations. And uh, actually, one of them had, a, had two doctorates that he did at the same time on two different topics, one at Harvard and one at Boston University. Some smart people. The president then, which wasn't Hubbard yet, the president said, I want you to get the faculty together and I want you to create a unified statement about what inspiration and revelation mean. They worked on it for a year most of it arguing. And I have the letter somewhere in a file, it's actually in the church office. Uh, I have the letter where the, where the faculty member who, was, who drew the short straw had to write a letter to the president of the seminary saying, we can't agree on this. We can't come to a single unified expression of what inspiration and revelation means. I say that as a way of letting us all off the hook. We're not gonna know we're not going to have a great answer for that question now, but we believe, we believe that the uh, that the Old and New Testaments are in some way given to us in the form that we have them by the Holy Spirit. Second thing is the that the Bible is the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus in the church. Now. This is really important because there are things about Jesus and the meaning of Jesus' ministry that we can only learn in the Bible. Uh, people will say things like, oh, nature is where I meet God. That's enough for me. I, I experience enough of God, you know, when I see beautiful things or when I see people living in community. And I'm going to say that that's really only partially true because whatever we see and experience in our life, if it's in order to understand what God is doing in Jesus Christ, we have to have the scriptures as a guide and a definer of what those experiences might be. Here's my example for that. If you had a video in the tomb where Jesus was dead for three days, and the video actually captured, actually captured Jesus the Messiah coming back from the dead. If you had that video without the explanation of the scriptures that this is God uh, offering his own son as sacrifice, um, raising him from the dead to demonstrate that he has power over all things, even death. If you don't have the words to explain it, you just have a really interesting video. And so the words matter. And the Old and the New Testaments are the unique and authoritative witness to who Jesus Christ is uh, in the church. And so um, the Bible holds those things together for the gathered church. It's also true for individuals, and I think that's why the third one is there, because the third clause in the question is, and it is God's word to us. That's the personal part. The Bible is by the Holy Spirit. It is the unique and authoritative witness to Christ for the church, and it is God's word to us. Um, that third statement uh, is, it, you know, we the, the Bible uh, is the source of definitions that the church needs to give uh, order, but it's also God speaking to each one of us individually. It's 
this is where the parent speaking words of love to a baby becomes a perfect image. It is God's word to us. It's God reaching into our crib or stroller and nuzzling us and giving us a kiss and saying something that we can't possibly understand fully, but that it communicates warmth and compassion and love to us. And so the, um, as we go through this journey, we're gonna look at how a lot of these things uh, took place, how the books were written, how they were compiled, how, for example, Genesis became Genesis, how in Genesis, Moses dies, but Moses is supposed to be the writer of Genesis. We're gonna address that question and another dozen or so like it in the, in the Old and New Testaments, because, I think getting a better understanding of how the Bible comes about gives us a better footing for figuring out what the Bible is going to be saying to us. And so as we move through this, we'll talk about um, uh, the manuscripts that got passed down from generation to generation. Remember that the New Testament survives for 1,500 years without a printing press with people just copying it by hand over and over and over and over again. And uh, we'll, we'll spend a little time on how those manuscripts come to become our translated uh, Bibles that we have and that we read. And so that's a ton of intro. And we're gonna do other topics as we go on in later weeks, but I'm gonna open it up for discussion and uh, and maybe some of your questions now will help me set a little bit more direction uh, for the next couple of, uh, for the next month or so. Let me unmute you. Ask all to unmute. There you go. So you, you either have no questions or a gazillion questions. My money's on a gazillion. Oh, Steve, please. Um, so when Jesus is in the synagogue and he reads uh, from a scroll, uh, that scroll is uh, written in common Greek. That's a great question. And there's a <laughs> regional variation on who uses which set of Old Testament documents. And so in Jerusalem, it would be likely that it would be a Hebrew scroll. But in the synagogues outside of Jerusalem, and the farther you got from Jerusalem, the more likely it would be Greek. So up in Galilee, it may have been, they may have been more familiar with gr the Greek Old Testament. And in Jerusalem, they would have been more familiar with the Hebrew Old Testament. The closer to the temple, the closer to the, the holy mountain in Jerusalem, the more likely they were to use Hebrew. I was just thinking that there had to be people that rebelled to Alexander's, you know, edict that they, that they use the common Greek. And there must yeah. have been people that said, well, we're, we better start writing down these stories that we've just been transmitting orally. Right. That, that's one of the interesting parts of the story, because in the places, in the far-flung areas where there were pockets of Jews, uh, if they didn't have a written Hebrew scroll, by the time they wrote it down, oftentimes they wrote it down in Greek, which means that in some parts of the Jewish world that Diaspora is an important word. I got to use it a bunch of times. The diaspora is the spread, the dispersion of Jews uh, around the known world um, away from uh, Jerusalem or Israel. And so in the Jewish diaspora, uh, a lot of them never had a written Hebrew one. They passed it down from generation to generation. But by the time they wrote it down, they could speak Hebrew, but they could write Greek. And so oftentimes, so uh, there's just a very interesting book came out about 10 years ago. Uh, 
And his argument was that for a significant part of the Jewish world in the centuries before Jesus, uh, the Old Testament in these communities was written in Greek before it was ever written in Hebrew. which is totally counterintuitive to what we think, right? We think Old Testament's got to be in Hebrew, New Testament's right. got to be in Greek. Nope. Hmm. Brooke, please. So who held the stories? Was that everybody or was that just priests or who held those stories and orally transpired? I, think they, I think they got transmitted in families but even now, the, the practice of a young Jewish boy or girl uh, memorizing a long piece of Hebrew scripture for a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah, that's, that's a continuity. That, that's a, an expression of continuity with the way the scriptures were passed down uh, when, when they didn't have the scrolls. Um, so I would imagine a lot of that happened around uh, synagogues, and synagogues are places of Jewish worship away from the temple. Um, and so, uh, but I think they also happened a lot in families um, over time. Yeah, Jack, please. Well, I think uh, the... the uh, beginnings of the Old Testament, Genesis 1 through 11 and so forth, uh, probably were, cre cre were created after 586 BC. Uh, you talked about the diaspora, which happened in 722 BC when the Assyrians came and they dispersed the Northern Kingdom, but you still have the Southern Kingdom. But mm -hmm. then when the Babylonians destroyed the Southern Kingdom in 586 BC, and they didn't get back to the Holy Land until I guess it was 539. And in that period, they began to uh, reclaim their faith. So they would have to, at that time, start, I would think, uh, recruiting that stuff in, in the Hebrew. But yeah. like you say, uh, after Alexander and so forth, with the Koine Greek, and then you have the collection of, of uh, Jewish scholars, uh, they call the Septuagint, yeah, and, and and that's kind of a story. I mean, you know it better than I do. Well, well but, you're getting all my bullet points for up. Yeah, okay, seventy back, scholars, but, uh, and they <laughs> and they come up with the with the uh, with the Bible with the yeah. Old Testament in in the in the Greek. Yeah, yeah, but I think that's interesting, and and this this is something that that resonates with me that uh, oftentimes the Bible being written down in an organized way is a response to crisis. And so uh, that oral tradition worked until the people of God were exiled out of their homeland. Mm -hmm. And they realized that you couldn't spend four hours a day reciting scripture. You were going to be slaves in another country or you were going to be a displaced person. You didn't know if you got to keep those things. And so uh, Jack's exactly right. The, the writing down of these things, a, a lot of it happens in response to crisis. Um, when we talked, uh, when we were doing Amos, uh, you know, there's a Northern Kingdom for a long time, uh, the, what would be called uh, Israel uh, now was split in two, a, a Southern Kingdom and a Northern Kingdom, and they were both taken into exile at different times. And that created the need to write down scripture. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting, it's two or three centuries apart, which is all, um, is probably less a distance of time than 300 years will be now. Let me just say that better. Uh, one historian said that if you picked somebody up in the early Middle Ages, say in the year five or 600 in Europe, and you plopped them down in the same spot 600 years later, it's likely that they wouldn't have noticed much difference because not much changed during that time. Uh, for ex but you know, as we talk about Queen Elizabeth and all the things that have happened just during her reign, we see that change has been much more rapid in the modern world than it was in the ancient world. And so um, uh, 
the the scriptures from the northern and southern kingdoms, even though they're three centuries apart, are remarkably similar. But they're also, in a very interesting way, different. And we're going to get to some of that. Yeah, sure are. And, and what that means for us, uh, having grown up in a culture that is hung up on the meaning of every word and, and word ending and uh, prefix and suffix and uh, goodness, in Greek, there are infixes. There are things they tuck in the middle of the word that change the, the meaning of the word. Whole dissertations have been written on little, you know, anyway, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of that. Tad, please save me. Yeah, I, so something that I came across recently that was shocking is the oral tradition was critically important, period, because a very, very few people at that time were literate. Right. I, I mean, the highest estimate is 10% and the lowest yeah. estimate is 1%. I mean, yeah. so it was only the educated, a very small percentage of people who ha had access to. Yeah. And look how big the Old Testament is. I mean, uh, there may have been people within, remember communities didn't, weren't, tr people didn't move in and out of communities either. You're, you're likely to have been with two or three generations of your own family in a community that was made up of people that were with two or three generations of their own families. So communities stayed together. And I don't know if this is true, but the logic of it makes sense to me that every household may have been responsible for a different part of uh, uh, of the scriptures to hold on to it and to pass it on from parent to child. Uh, it a lot and it it accounts for some of the interesting variations. If it's a family of farmers passing the scriptures down or a blacksmith's family, you never know. Um, and, and yet those variations do, and, and then they're passed on because the next generation memorizes it just the way the last person told it to them. And so, um, yeah, we'll, we'll explore a little bit of that. Uh, there's a, a book, this one is, um, the, the one I'm talking about is called When God Spoke Greek. This is not an easy book, but it's a really interesting book and it's, it's worth the work, but it may not be the best first book about biblical studies that, uh, that you decide to tackle. But um, when God spoke Greek is, um, is an exploration of Judaism uh, during the time when the Greek Old Testament was better known than the Hebrew Old, Test Old Testament and had a more, more of a, uh, a lasting influence on parts of the Hebrew tradition, I mean the Jewish tradition, than the Hebrew did. So it's really an interesting, it's, it's a very, very interesting book. Um, I'm going to come back to it uh, to tell a little bit more of that story in detail uh, because it, it makes a point about um, how largely American and British conservative Christianity has tried to preserve the hard-edged accuracy of every word. What you find out is that for more than a thousand years, there's a lot of variation in the ways that Isaiah is told, or Amos, or the Psalms, or even the Torah. There, there are variations, and there are regional variations. There are variations that make sense to the region they came from, but they all still tell the same story about God, just not with that verbal, hard-edged accuracy that we have come to want. And uh, that's, uh, think about that part that I just said, because that's something for us to reflect on through this whole class is what, what's the Bible supposed to be? We, we want to ask that question so that we have a better understanding of what the Bible's supposed to do. Um, so, we have a few more minutes. Uh, I, I'm clearly uh, out of practice estimating how long my notes will take uh, to get through. Um, but I also think that's a lot of detail to try and take in. Um, the uh, Anybody have a question about 
the Bible you have, or maybe the one that you grew up with, there, uh, uh, I can I can go to my go-to stuff and say, anybody here grow up with a Ryrie study Bible or a Schofield study Bible? Yeah. 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 Millions, millions and millions of Schofield Bibles out there. Uh, so much so that there's a, a parody of a hymn in the fundamentalist era that says, my hope is built on nothing less than Schofield's notes and Moody Press. <laughs> right. I love it. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> um, I think your introduction is fab fabulous. It's well, it's good to know the details, know the testaments, know that how many books there are. We're going to talk about the different kinds of writing uh, that are uh, that are in the Bible. Uh, it's funny when I was going through an old folder this week from uh, I, I taught this class. The fir very first time I taught this class was 1987. Um, and what I did was, back then, the LA Times had cl clearly, back when people read newspapers, the LA Times had clearly defined sections. And so I got five chairs in front of the class. This is a live class. And I put the front section and then uh, the uh, what they called Metro, uh, which was about LA, just about LA local news, and then sports and then business and the uh, what they called the calendar section, which was entertainment and classifieds. And it's funny, you know, we, it, it seems complicated that the Bible has different kinds of literature and we got to read them differently. And, and, you know, we, some things you don't want to try and find in one book, but you want to find them in the other and, but you don't want to mix those around. We do that so naturally with the sections of a newspaper in the front section that's where you're gonna get your big headlines and global news. In the Metro section, you get news that's local. In the sports section, you get whether or not the Dodgers beat the Giants or the Giants beat the Dodgers the, night, the previous night. And then, and then so on down, right? You get the business. Back then you had to go to the business section to see how stocks were doing. Do you guys remember looking at stock prices in the newspaper? Can you imagine now? <laughs> um, and then there was the entertainment section and then the classifieds. And so what I would ask them is, if you wanted to find out what was going on in the Middle East, what section would you look at? And they all said the front section. And if you wanted to find out how the Rams are doing right now, uh, you go to the sports section. If you want to buy a puppy back then, you could, you could shop for dogs in the classified section. And so everybody knew instinctively which section to go for, for which kind of writing, for which kind of information. Now, you'd never go to the front section to buy a puppy. And unless it was the World Series, you probably wouldn't get a sports score in one of the news sections. You'd get it in the sports page. And if you wanted to find out what time the movie was playing, you wouldn't go to the classifieds. You'd go to the entertainment section. See, we all do it not, we not only know where to go for different kinds of information in a local newspaper, we also know where not to go. Part of this journey will be to help us know where to go in the scriptures for certain kinds of guidance and teaching and inspiration, and also where not to go for certain kinds of teaching and guidance and inspiration. Okay, those are, uh, you do this all already. You're just going to transfer those skills to looking at the Bible. Right. Any other questions in our final, we got a few minutes left. So are you going to talk about a particular version or are we going more generic? Uh, we're probably going more generic at the beginning, but we'll talk about uh, the different um, translations. And, um, uh, you know, eventually it'd be nice if you all had yours handy uh, while we do this, because we will look at certain things to try and get a feel for uh, the difference, let's say, between a book of the Torah and a psalm or a book of uh, that chronicles, well, chronicles, which tells the story of the kings, 
Uh, but then there's also a whole other set of books called The Kings. How come there are two sets of two-part books that tell the stories of some of the same and some different kings? We're going to talk about that. Um, and some of that is just made a little bit more interesting when we look at different um, translations. Um, so just in the last couple minutes, I'll give you a gimme here just because this is important. There are translations of the Bible, and there are paraphrases of translations of the Bible. Anybody here have a living Bible somewhere kicking around? Yeah. yeah. So that's a paraphrase of another translation. That is not a Bible that was produced directly from the Hebrew or the Greek. Doesn't make it bad, just you need to know that. That's uh, in, our, in our passion for accuracy, sometimes that became an important question. The NIV and the Revised Standard Version, um, which was very controversial when it came out. I'm going to read you part of an article when we get to the RSV where a, that talks about a pastor who took a blowtorch into the pulpit and tried to burn it in front of his congregation. And when he couldn't get it to burn, he said it's because it already came through the fires of hell. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> you got to give him credit for a good oh, save. Wow. And, uh, but it, almost that entire militant, angry overreaction to the RSVP, uh, RSVP so the RSV, uh, was because of one word. And we're going to talk about that word uh, in a couple of weeks. So. Any other final questions or comments? Is this going to work for you guys to kind of move through this history like this? Sure. Great. Right. Absolutely. Uh, Steve? I was just going to say that's the Bible that I grew up with at, at Knox Presbyterian Church. The, the RSV? Yeah. The yeah. R, the Revised Standard Version. Yeah. 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 Well, I did, I, I, I did know a guy who wore a hat that said... If the King James was good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> and That's so, great. all I can say to that is that next time there's an ad for a Bible study or a class about the Bible at your church, uh, please try and attend because we'll we'll make sure that you don't make that mistake um, on a hat or a shirt or a bumper sticker. <laughs> Sorry, Todd, did you have? <laughs> Tad, did you have a question? Well, I'm looking forward to it because a couple of years ago, I just read the Bible from page one straight through. Goodness. Just like, well, you know, I don't know whether it answered more questions or raised more questions. It's an entirely different, when you read it that way, it's entirely different than reading this verse or that verse. So. Yeah. Uh, uh. Yeah, so I'm I'm really looking forward to, and I know Jack will correct you if you make a mistake. So. <laughs> I have I have no doubt. I have no doubt. But, uh, uh, well, thanks for being here. Thanks for coming back, and uh, we'll we'll do this again next uh, next Thursday at seven. Uh, we'll do a little bit more on um, on the on the Old Testament, on the Greek Old Testament and the Hebrew Old Testament and, and some of the, the differences and, and variations there. And, and we'll talk a little bit about how the texts were gathered together and became uh, the Hebrew Bible. Um, I, I did have a, a, a brilliant professor at Cal State Northridge where I went for a semester uh, and took a class on an introduction to the Bible. And he had this very complicated lecture on how the New Testament was gathered. And he said, most Christians, when they were looking for the Old Testament, they just used whatever the Jews were using. So it, the, the Christian tradition has not done a lot of its own work. And this is, I think, to their credit, at gathering an Old Testament. We accept the, the Jewish scriptures as they have been passed down from generation to generation. And we interpret the New Testament in light of the old, but we interpret all of it through the prism and filter of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it'll be good for us. I'll circle back to that a few times, but it'll be good for us to have a few uh, lines like that in our head that become part of this, the muscle and sinew of how we read the Bible. 
we read the Old Testament, we read the New Testament as a progression from the Old Testament, but we read all of it um, as people who are on this side of the cross and the empty tomb. And that changes how we read the Bible. Yeah. So with that, oh, sorry, Pam, please. I, I'm just curious, will the link be the same every week? The link will be the same every week. So you can, you can you're gonna get it, it every week, but right. you're also, you can also save this one. Right. Okay. Uh, as Thank long as you. we're in the crawl through the Bible class, this will be the link. Okay. Great. Okay. All right, everybody, let me uh, close us in prayer and, uh, and we can get on with our evenings. Uh, let's pray together. God, we thank you for the gift of your words, uh, and we thank you for the gift of your word, your son. Um, may uh, everything that we talk about and everything that we do be an honest attempt to understand what it is you're trying to say to us and what you're trying to say through us. Uh, we pray this in your son's name. Amen. 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 Have a great thank evening, you guys. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Right. See you thank Sunday. You.